Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Hi everybody, my name is Christine Huseman. I am a Master Gardener volunteer for the Prince William County Master Gardeners and I've been working for a full service tree care company for about eight years and I will be sitting for my arborist certification in January. Um, I'm here today to talk about pruning basics. Uh, so let's get started. We're going to start out with the basics, literally, the benefits of trees. Um, we're going to improve air and water quality. Uh, trees do this on their own. Uh, they prevent erosion depending on where they're positioned. They provide wildlife benefits. They reduce your stress, sort of, sometimes. Depends on what's going on with your trees. Uh, they lower energy costs. They can improve your property values. Um, and of course, they also provide carbon sequestration. This next slide here is just a very beautiful mountain laurel. It is Calmia latifolia, um, and it's just something that everybody should have a nice view of. <laughs> okay, so trees versus bushes. Some people get these confused, so we're going to break it down. Trees are woody perennials with one main stem uh, that is four and a half feet above the ground. Um, so if you think about chest height, if there's one main stem up to that point, then you're looking at a tree. If it is multi-stemmed below chest height um, or a perennial that is forked, that's going to be technically considered a bush or a woody perennial. That's the best word there. Um, tree is a species that can sometimes take a bush form and bushes can sometimes take a tree form. So you need to make sure that you are very careful and cautious about knowing your species and what it can tolerate. Um, you're going to hear me say that a lot throughout this presentation, so be prepared. <laughs> All right, so how does a tree grow? Does it grow up from the ground with branches getting higher every year? Does it add growth from the ends of its stems so that branches are always in the same place on the tree? The honest answer to both of those questions is depends on the age of your tree and the species. Again, know your species. Trees are always going to grow towards the light. Uh, they're going to grow up to get more sunlight. You can see this in your uh, tropical forest where everything's reaching up as high as possible to get through the canopy. Um, sometimes they'll grow sideways. Uh, if you see red buds on the edge of a forest all over Virginia, they are growing out at a great angle to try and get to that light. Forest trees grow up more than open grown trees. So a tree that's in a forest is going to go more upright than a tree that's out in an open field. That's going to spread. They fill in to try and, or they will try to fill in any available space that receives sunlight. Uh, even if that causes structural problems. So tree biology. Uh, trees grow from the cambium layer in between the bark and the wood. This is a great visual of that and we'll focus in on that in just a moment so that you can see a little bit more. But the cambium forms xylem and phloem, which are what move water and food around the tree. Xylem specifically <laughs> uh, transports water and nutrients to the leaves. So the xylem is upbound. The phloem flows, so flows down, flows sugars from the leaves to the roots. Inside of the live xylem is older wood, known as heartwood. That's you, where, where your tree gets its strength from and its stability. The outside of uh, the live phloem is bark, which is also no longer living, um, but it provides protection. Um, as I mentioned, in this particular um, slide, you can see the heartwood, the sapwood, and that vascular cambium. That's that green layer that if you scrape through a little bit of bark on a young tree, you're going to be able to see that green layer. And that's what tells you that your tree is healthy and growing. There are two different types of growth. Um, primary or apical growth comes from buds from buds at the end of stems, or apical meristems. Um, it, it helps the trees to grow long, it adds height and spread to the crowns. So think of uh, the crown of your tree, that's what you're going to see at the very end of all of your branches, the branch tips, is your apical meristems. 
The secondary or lateral growth comes from the cambium layer and is called lateral meristem. And that's what allows the tree to grow thicker all the way around your branches, your trunk. Okay, apical growth um, is vigorous, fast growth, and it doesn't last forever. Once a tree reaches maturity, that apical growth is gonna slow down significantly, um, and the tree will only replace lost branches at that point. Lateral growth is really dependent on rainfall, the amount of sunlight, and the health of the plant. And it occurs all over the plant, just under the bark. So it's not something you're really gonna see dramatic differences in. There are two main types of growth forms in a tree. There's an excurrent tree, which is your upright growth form. It's a strong central leader, a straight trunk all the way to the top of the tree. So think about a pin oak. Um, that's gonna be nice and straight all the way up. It's gonna branch usually half as big as the trunk. So if your trunk is 10 inches, you might have branches that are as large as five inches. And it's gonna have a strong pyramidal shape. A decurrent tree is a rounded tr crown. Uh, so think of your uh, maples is a really good example. Uh, trunk branches in the crown, several main stems with smaller branches. So you get that nice rounded look. In this slide, you can see actually examples of both, um, but the primary example here is gonna be your X current tree to the very right-hand side of that picture, which is growing straight up. And then here you can still see that same tree, but you get a better glimpse of the smaller D current tree um, that was next to it as well. Growth can cause some problems in trees. Um, epicormic growth uh, is poor attachment. It's debilitating to the tree in terms of its ability to uh, move things through the xylem and the phloem. You can get a bad crotch shape, um, in which case you're looking at a, a really tight crotch is something that's bad because it'll create, create bark issues. Um, included bark. Um, you see that a lot in your co-dominant trees. It needs to be dealt with early on, uh, but we'll get into that later. Uh, more about the pore structure, rubbing branches and competing branches. Over time, they're going to become one, and it's just going to weaken the tree overall um, because they're not forming a, a, a nice structure. We'll dig into more of the pruning along the way, but all of these are problems that you want to correct when trees are young. To get more specific, the epicormic branches that we talked about earlier, um, technically they come from adventitious buds. They are apical meristems, remember the ones that are out on the ends, hidden inside the cambium. They lay dormant until the growth is triggered, either over the loss of an end bud, like a branch breaking, um, or over pruning or increased light. If you lose a tree next to one, you've suddenly got increased light coming in. Those might trigger some of those buds and they result in those epicormic branches or water sprouts. Some species produce these from the roots, um, but it can happen all over the tree and it causes fast growing weak wood that is attached very, very poorly. So you wanna watch those and try and get rid of them as they come up. This is a great example of adventitious bud growth. Um, you can see um, in the center, I can't really point at this, so I apologize, uh, but in the very center, you can see that there is a branch or uh, actually probably a co-dominant stem that was cut off at one point, and these were triggered by that cut, and they started to grow, and now you've got incredibly tight, very weak wood that's only gonna break away. Branches normally extend into the trunk. Um, so if the trunk of your tree you've got a branch, it's actually gonna be developed all the way through because this growth began a long time ago and it's, uh, it's a cantilever. It allows it to make a strong branch attachment. So the branches can wiggle and move a little bit, but they've got a good strong structural base inside. Epicormic branches, the ones we were just looking at, begin so close to the bark of the tree that they're not, that they're just far weaker in the way that they're placed. They don't have that structural integrity inside of the trunk. 
Uh, the irregular branches can have bad attachments though, depending on the angle that they grow at. If your trunk is straight, figure this is a 90 degree, you want your angles to be somewhere between 60 and 45 in here. It's, it, it, that's gonna be your best attachment point. Doesn't always work perfectly. Don't be too concerned if it doesn't. Your crotch shape. Uh, a crotch is where two parts of the tree or a bush come together, uh, either a twig and a branch or a branch and a trunk or two trunks if you have a co-dominant species. A V-shaped crotch is bad because the bark's gonna get stuck between. As it's growing, it's rubbing, and it's gonna create bark inside of that space. I'll give you a great example of that in a moment. Um, this is called included bark, and it tremendously weakens the interior. Um, and that's when you see splits happening. Uh, Bradfords are famous for this. A U-shaped crotch is good. You want something that's a little bit more open. Um, that way, it's gonna keep growing, the bark is gonna keep forming, and it's not going to rub. It's just like a bad branch or crossing branches. This is a V-shape, very obvious, and you can kind of see the included bark forming there. Um, it's not as visible on the outside, it never is, but if you want, see an opening of a tree in a minute, that will really give you a good example of it. This is a good U-shaped crotch. You can see that the bark is continuing to form on the outside and giving it that layer of protection rather than previously, you can see moisture is gonna get trapped in there and other things, pathogens especially. Codominant tree has two stems uh, that are both acting as a main stem or leader. So they come up together and they'll kind of break away a little bit, give you that V formation. The crotch angle is extremely narrow, that V formation again, and eventually the bark gets trapped inside or becomes included bark. It is a major structure weakness and will lead to the tree's failure ultimately. This is a great representation of that. You can see as this tree grew up, and this was cut to show you what it looks like, uh, but you could see as this tree grew up that it developed included bark, all the way through as a co-dominant tree. And ultimately, if that tree were left to stand on its own, it would have broken away at that point at some stage. Kind of like this example. This used to be a co-dominant tree. And at some point, one side of it broke away and now has left a gaping hole that is never going to heal because the, the coded principles will not follow here, unfortunately. It's still hanging in there though, so can't be all that bad, at least for that particular tree. Poor structure. Structure is how you want the, how you want the tree to look is not necessarily the same as what it needs. So you have to balance that. Um, rubbing branches are branches that touch all the time and will always be touching. They're not gonna grow away from each other, but they will grow around each other. They may actually grow to form one branch, but it's going to be an extremely weak branch if it's coming together that way. Um, competing branches are just the early stage of a rubbing branch, ultimately. They aren't touching yet, but they will be as they continue to compete for light, and they're probably not growing in that ideal structure for your tree. Again, we need to go back to that knowing your species, because sometimes you can let some things go for artistic reasons, maybe in a Japanese maple, but you need to be very, very careful with it. So we mentioned, I mentioned CODIT earlier. Uh, CODIT is the compartmentalization of decay in trees. Uh, CODIT is something that was brought to us by uh, Dr. Alex Shigo. Um, he spent much of his career studying trees. Uh, he's, quoted as saying, many people spend time on what goes wrong with a tree. I wanted to study what goes right. So he is considered the grandfather of arboriculture and has taught us amazing amounts of information. He developed CODIT in the late 70s. Um, basically, woody plants have their own ability to wall off decay and disease. Young plants do this very well. Older plants lose their ability to do this because as they mature, they're spending 
most of their time on an energy on maintenance as opposed to new growth, which is why young plants can, again, defend themselves much more strongly than an, a more mature tree. Uh, there are four walls of defense in terms of the coded principle. Um, there is the growth from the previous year, which goes towards the center of the tree. There is the up and down, the xylem and the phloem that we talked about earlier uh, within the wounded lines. And then there's the side to side uh, into the neighboring lines of xylem and phloem. And then finally, there's the next year's growth, which is the strongest portion of the healing process. It's what's going to cover up the wound. It takes a long time, depending on the size of the wound, for this to occur. It's not something that you're going to actually see completely happen in one season, but you can see the beginnings of it. So what is pruning? <laughs> Let's get to that. Um, if done incorrectly, pruning is just cutting things off wooding plants. Uh, basically walking up and going, oh, this branch is in my way. Let me just cut it off right here. You got to think about where you're making your cuts so that when pruning is done correctly, most of the process is defining your objectives from the beginning, deciding on the proper form, planning what kind of cuts you're going to make, and you might want to actually be looking at it from a long-term perspective, um, say in terms of structure pruning, and then finally cutting a few things off to facilitate what you want out of your tree. This is an example of not so great cuts. Um, if you look towards the top of this picture, you can see two stubs sitting out. Um, this is what we would call incorrect pruning. Those stubs are going to cause problems down the line. Uh, you can see them sticking out a little bit more. This is a close-up of that shot. Those stubs are going to let in pathogens. Um, pests, disease, and ultimately create more problems for the tree. If those were cut to the branch collar uh, properly, that would allow the wound to heal using the coded principle and the tree could continue to live its natural lifespan, hopefully. Uh, so back to what is pruning. Uh, pruning is the most common maintenance of trees and shrubs. Um, it should always be performed with the mindset of what is going to be left behind. Of course, we should consider what we are removing. We want to take away the dead, the dying, the diseased, decayed, um, crossing stems, because what we are going to be leaving behind, to go back to what is left, is what's going to be left for a very long time. So you want to think about what you're removing and what the long-term impact is going to be. Why do we prune? Some of the reasons for pruning are to correct growth issues that we discussed along the way so far. For safety, um, safety being uh, vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic, providing clearance for those same things. You want to make sure that you're getting dead wood out over a sidewalk or making sure that you can clear uh, a street sign. If there's a stop sign in, that is being blocked by a tree branch, you're going to need to get that out of the way. Uh, we also do it to reduce shade and wind resistance. Reducing shade if you're trying to do the impossible and grow turf and trees at the same time. They don't always like each other. Um, wind resistance if you're putting up a screening to help minimize the wind coming across a field towards your home. Um, you can prune to influence flower or fruit production. And of course, you can improve to uh, prune to improve your view or the aesthetics of a tree. Um, sometimes this breaks some of the rules of pruning, so you need to be careful with it. And you can also prune, of course, to encourage good structure in young trees so that as they get older, they will withstand a lot of the environmental stresses that are put on them. What should we prune? The four Ds, this is the basics that you need to know when you're walking in to look at your tree. The four things that you wanna take out first, you wanna take out any dead or dying branches, any diseased or decaying branches, and you also wanna take out damaged or broken branches. Sometimes it's hard to see the diseased ones 
Um, so the trick for that is to, if you think it's diseased, you can take your thumb, kind of rub away a little bit of the bark, and if you see that green layer that we talked about earlier, that young growth, that green growth, then it's probably not. If you don't see it and it's brown and, it's, and yucky, eh, you probably need to take that off. When you're pruning a diseased branch, you also want to take it back at least six inches past the disease so that you are hopefully eliminating the disease in it. Um, if you take it right to the edge of where you see the disease, there might be pathogens farther back and that will only continue to move along later on down the road. Last is what, well, my favorite word, it's the deranged. <laughs> um, severely crossing or conflicting branches, those ones we talked about earlier that are just going to cause problems for each other as the tree continues to grow. This is a slide that shows you what some of these look like. Uh, you can see the rubbing and crossing branches as you start from the top left. You'll want to remove those down so that they're no longer conflicting. Um, inadequate spacing between branches, that's a little touchy. You want to make sure that you're looking at the overall structure when you're taking that into consideration. Your water sprouts, uh, the epicormic branches that we talked about earlier, you can see those both in the tree and down at the ground. Um, they call them suckers at the ground, but they are the same thing. Uh, the unattractive and awkward branch. That's a matter of personal opinion. Make sure that you're taking out the four Ds first before you think about those. Because ultimately, you don't want to take more than 25% out of the crown at any given time. Uh, the dead or broken branch, remember that's the first one you're going to be looking for in those four Ds. And then your narrow and your weak crotch, the ones that are just way too tight to the tree. All right, so getting started with pruning. Now that we've gone through all of the problems that you could possibly face, let's start with the basics of pruning and moving on that. The first step in pruning is establishing your objectives and your planning. Knowing your species and what it will tolerate. You have to identify your species before you move forward. You want to know what it can handle, um, what its growth pattern is. Uh, what its lifespan is, all of these things you need to take into consideration when you're planning your pruning in terms of this season, next season, and moving forward. See, here you are. What species are you working with? <laughs> um, why do you want to cut something off of your tree? Is there a reason that you're doing this? Is it too close to your house, rubbing up against it, uh, maybe letting critters into your roof? Um, there are a number of reasons to consider, and we'll go through all of those. Um, what should be removed first? Go back to those four Ds. Remember, take out the dead, the dying, the disease, the deranged first. Um, what should be saved for next year or even later? That's going to depend on how much you're taking out of your tree at any given time. No more than 25% in one growing season. The risk analysis, ultimately, we are going to be cutting things off of trees and leaving behind a wound. Insects and disease can enter the tree through that wound, and it may not heal, depending on what the tree is going through, other environmental stresses, like disease and pests that are in the area that you may or may not be aware of. There's a lot of invasive species and disease and pests coming into the area that we're always on the watch for. You can't always know for sure. Um, you are taking a risk at pruning your tree. But there's really good reasons for doing it if the tree is healthy enough, and you always want to judge that as part of your consideration is, is my tree healthy? So how do you deal with your trees? Are your trees big? Are they little? Are they old? Are they young? Are you comfortable climbing up to where the problem is to fix it? Part of your planning, what is my tree? What is the species? How old is it? Is it a mature tree? Maybe I can't do as much pruning. If my problems are out of my reach, can I get to it safely with proper equipment? Or do I need to bring in a professional? Let's talk about large mature trees. Very large trees should be pruned by a professional. 
come to think of it. <laughs> An insured certified arborist. You do not want to try, try and prune your mature trees on your own. Uh, you need to be careful about the cuts you're making because they don't heal as readily as the younger trees. And if you take off a large limb, you may be doing more damage than good, depending on the lifespan of the tree. And trees weigh tons. Um, you'd be amazed. Um, limbs can weigh way more than you think. Um, sadly, we had an accident this year uh, with a piece of equipment only. No people involved, yay. Um, but lost a piece of equipment for probably another couple of months until it can be repaired because a piece of branch fell on it. Um, mature trees grow more slowly, uh, they use more energy to maintain themselves, and they have fewer defenses against insects and disease, so they can't handle severe pruning. That 25% of the crown thing in a mature tree, you're really only going to take out the dead wood, the disease, the decayed, the broken. You're not going to do much more than that because you don't want to take away from the maintenance that the tree is trying to do by forcing it to try and produce new growth. Uh, pruning should only fix major problems, remove the risk, the dead, the damaged stems. The goal should be to keep the trees alive and as healthy for as long as possible. Small young trees. It is easier to deal with problems when they are small. Um, young trees with problems like codominance, poor crotch shape, crossing branches, all those things we talked about earlier on, the dead and dying wood can be fixed relatively easily, uh, preventing large unfixable problems later on, like those codominant trees that build up included bark. If you get it early, you don't have that problem later. If a tree is young and rev relatively small, you can get away with making a few mistakes and trying it for yourself and having a little fun with it because it's going to be able to bounce back better. What you need to be cautious of is a small tree that is not actually young but old. Some species don't necessarily get to be that big and they can't be pruned as intensively as a young tree. It's, it's a mature tree, it's just a small tree. Um, you might be able to get away with correcting the form a little bit but again, it'll take a lot longer to heal because it really is a mature trait. Is it the right time to prune? Deadwood can be removed at any time of the year with little or no harm to the tree. Diseased parts of a tree should be pruned as soon as they are noticed. And again, you wanna take that back six inches past or to a healthy lateral um, as soon as it's noticed because that way it doesn't have a chance to spread any further. Some diseases may require more severe pruning and may, it might actually make more sense to take down the tree, but that's something that you would have to judge based on what you see. You might wanna get an arborist involved depending on the level of disease that we're talking about. Um, trees that flower on old wood should be pruned right after flowering. Uh, so, for instance, I have a mock orange in my yard that I do my pruning after it has done flowering and all the pretty white petals are all over my deck. <laughs> but it's beautiful while it's in bloom, so I let it hang and I climb under it to get to my house and then I prune it. <laughs> Everything else should be pruned in late winter or very early spring or in the dormant season, just before the buds begin to swell. There are some sensitive trees that you really want to watch your timing on. Um, fruit trees, stone fruits especially. When we say you want to prune it in the dormant season, December, January, that's true, but you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on your weather. You might want to wait until after Valentine's Day. That's a Peter Deal rule. Uh, because after you can watch the weather at that point, if we think we're going to get a really deep freeze for a couple of days, you don't want to be pruning right before that because it can also be damaging. It's a consideration to keep in mind. Uh, Midsummer, you can do some pruning there, but it's not as ideal as being done in the dormant season. Pruning right after the first flush of growth in the spring can limit the growth and the health of a tree. This is why we don't do that. Pruning in the fall when trees are trying to shut down for the winter 
can also cause problems for the tree. Remember the xylem and the phloem that are moving everything. In the very late fall, when the tree, the leaves have all turned pretty colors, but they're still hanging on to the tree, that's when this tree is doing its most for storage for the winter so that it'll be ready come spring to start all over again. And you don't want to prune your tree then because the nutrients that are flowing back are not going to be able to make it if they're not there. Okay, so is a tree healthy enough to prune? Tree healthy enough to prune. I think I tied my tongue up there, excuse me. <laughs> Twig extension is going to be the best indicator of tree growth. Um, if it is continue, look, you're going to want to look at many of the twigs on the tree, not just one. Look at the whole crown. How much has it grown in the past few years? Can you see new buds up at the top on all of the twigs? Healthy trees can be pruned, like I said earlier, up to 25% in any one growing season. But less healthy trees should be pruned a little bit more lightly. Um, uh, maybe just the deadwood and the disease or the broken. And then maybe wait a season and then go back and look at the aesthetics. Um, let it recover from the disease removal, things that might impact it. The deadwood should not, but give it a season to bounce back. So pruning rules of thumb, I think I've covered several of these repeatedly, but let's do it again. Um, don't cut off a stem more than three inches in diameter. You don't want to cut off anything larger than that because you're, you're going to be opening a wound that may be more than your tree can handle if you're not very well versed in your trees. <laughs> Don't cut off more than 25% of the crown in any one season. Uh, this does not include your deadwood, um, but everything else counts. Uh, if a tree is not showing good signs of health, remember, don't prune quite so much. A really good way to judge how much you've taken out is to keep everything in a pile near your tree so you can look at the pile and your crown and say, hmm, that's 15%, I can take a couple more branches, but only a couple. Or, why? Well, I need to stop now, <laughs> which is usually what happens to me. <laughs> All right, so before you get out there and start working on your trees, make sure that you're being safe about it. Workplace safety is hugely important. I can tell you horror stories. I get a report, actually, every week of all the horror stories that happen in the industry. Eye protection is absolutely necessary. Uh, even when you're just uh, using a handsaw um, to prune something, there's going to be debris. There's going to be sawdust. And if the breeze picks it up, it could go flying right into your eye. If you're doing it overhead, you better have good goggles on. <laughs> Gloves are important, too, to protect your hands and improve your grip. Uh, you want to make sure that you're keeping your tools sharp and oiled properly. Um, they will work more, far more efficiently this way, um, plus you're more likely to cause damage with a dull tool. You're not going to make as clean a cut, and that's important. If you have the confidence to be using a chainsaw, please make sure you're using ear protection, and I beg of you, wear chaps. A uh, hard hat is necessary if you're doing overhead work, but I'm going to tell you as someone in this industry, please don't do overhead work with a chainsaw. It is way too dangerous. Uh, again, horror stories about homeowners who have been permanently disabled because they were trying to do something a little bit more than they should have. Pruning tools. Uh, pruning tools are gonna be hand pruners for working with small stems. You want to be using a bypass pruner not an anvil printer. Uh, bypass printers, I've got a picture of one coming up later on that I can show you, um, are the ones that are going to make a complete cut, whereas the anvil is gonna do a crush cut, and that's not gonna be good for your trees. Um, when I say small stems, you wanna be using your hand printers for things that are the size of your pinky. If it's much larger than that, you, you need to be moving up to a compound printer um, or a large set of yeah, compound printers. Um, a great handsaw for 
doing anything that is a little bit larger and can but does and is not going to work well with your compounds because you can't necessarily access it properly. Um, bypass loppers, again, not anvil um, or compounds, depending on what you call them. Um, pruning saws, be, use caution with pruning saws. Um, make sure that you are um, not cutting into the next branch. Um, make sure that you are considering your uh, cuts very carefully when you're using a saw. Uh, pole saws, great for overhead work. Um, there are a variety available. Make sure you're getting something as lightweight as you can because that overhead work gets to be painful. Chainsaws, again, be careful, please, I beg of you. Um, if you're comfortable using them, great. If you're not, please call a professional. Um, with all the saws that you use, you need to make sure, again, that you're only cutting the stem that you're trying to remove. Oh, there's those bypass pruners, yay. Um, these are your hand pruners or your bypass pruners. Um, they are outstanding for cutting small stuff. Uh, keep them sharp because you want to make sure that you are cutting cleanly. It is incredibly important if you are leaving rips, you are opening up decay and pathogen pathways. How to make your cuts? You are always going to cut close uh, cut back close to the branch collar. I will show you some great examples of the branch collar in a moment. Um, or you're going to reduce the branch weight by cutting farther out um, so that when you go back and do a finishing cut at the branch collar, you're not risking causing a break or a rip. <clears throat> you don't want to make flush cuts that are flush to the trunk of a tree. You want to make them at the branch collar, which I will again show you in a moment. Um, and you're going to want to use the three cut method. Um, for anything that is larger than an inch in diameter because um, the weight that's going to be on that branch could potentially cause it to rip, which I'll show you as well. Um, the branch collar is the area where a limb or a stem stops providing enough food to the rest of the plant and the tree starts a shedding process. It's a special ring of material that forms right at the junction of a limb and a parent trunk um, and it's it this is coated in its beauty it's the branch defense zone it is the first zone um, and it will close the wound with wound wood that's the last part that's wall number four um, and it has special chemicals to help limit decay in that area this is a great example of your branch collar. You can see the multiple ridges as it leads up to the branch. Those ridges have been formed over years and years of growth. It was, it's been protecting this branch to help keep it from breaking away from the tree, but now the branch has died off and you wanna go ahead and get rid of it. Your final cut is gonna be just outside that branch collar. You don't wanna damage the branch collar. Avoid that at all costs. Here's another example of a branch collar, not as easy to see as the other one. But if you look at the very top, you can see where it almost has three stairs. One, two, three. You're going to take that off. That third stair really isn't actually probably part of that branch collar. But if you want to play it safe, that's where you're going to make your cut. And then if you go down to the bottom, you see a little inverted V notch. That's the bottom of that branch collar. So you're gonna, your cut is going to come a little bit farther out. It's not going to be at the trunk, which it was cut this way to show you that example. Um, but it was a tree that was already going to be taken down anyway. This is an example of your wound wood. You can see that it's exuding a little bit of sap probably a maple. Mm, yeah, I'm going with a maple based on the bark. But you can see how the wound wood is starting to heal over what used to be an open cut. So the three cut method, we talked about that briefly earlier. This is where you're going to provide an undercut first. You're going to cut halfway through the branch from the bottom so that you're going 
about halfway through, a, a third to halfway through the branch. And you want to make sure it's on the underside. The top cut is then going to come an inch or two further out than the first cut so that as the branch then breaks away, it's going to have a stopping point where it's not going to rip back to the trunk. Um, and the final cut is going to be to take off the stub itself at the branch collar. This uh, slide shows you that in picture form. Your first cut, again, it's at the bottom about halfway through. Your second cut is at the top, comes the rest of the way through, and then it will break, but only break back to the point of your first cut. And then your final cut leaves the branch collar. If you look to the right-hand side, you can see what that looks like on the tree after it's all been said and done. This is an example of why we do this, the three cut method or the snap cut, so that you do not end up having the branch rip off as, from the weight of it as you are cutting through along the way, because that rip just damaged the branch collar and it's going to be incredibly difficult for the tree to heal that wound. This is a great example of a nice pruning cut. Out at the very edge, you can see that it's actually starting to heal the way the green is a little bit raised in that ring right around it. And then you see the bark. Um, that ring is the, the cambion. It's the healthy. It's the, it's the wound wood starting to form. Um, this shows you kind of both examples, good and bad. At the very top, you see a good cut. You can see the branch collar where it was. The bottom cut, not quite so pretty, but there may have actually been a reason for that cut. If that branch broke off and left a damaged stub, it may have been cut away for that reason, just to correct the break. Um, Still not a great cut though. <laughs> you can see a little bit of the branch collar, but not quite as much as you would like to see. So wait, what about bushes? We've talked about trees, 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 trees. Code it works with bushes too. It's the exact same principle because it is a woody perennial. The pruning is just on a smaller scale. Uh, so you really don't need big saws for that most of the time. Included bark and crossing stems can still be a problem depending on how your plants are developing. Dead and disease should still be removed any time of year. Um, and usually your woody perennials can get cut back a little bit more severely, but again, you need to know your species and what it will tolerate. You can't always cut everything down to the ground. Some species you can do that with and they'll bounce back the next year without even blinking an eye. <laughs> So in summary, uh, large and mature trees should be handled by professionals, um, and it should be limited to fixing high-risk problems, dead wood that could be a safety issue for targets like buildings and people. Um, pruning young trees can fix problems before they become major issues, and it can be handled by a knowledgeable gardener. That would be you. <laughs> Always consider the natural form of your plant. In question, never remove more than 25% of the crown per year. That goes for your woody perennials too. And stems larger than three inches to diameter should not be removed either. And this last slide is just a little bit of resources for everybody. If you guys are looking for an arborist for your mature trees, please check out uh, MAC ISA and the ISA. That is the International Society of Arboriculture, basically the uh, um, guidelines for our industry. Uh, both of these sites are provided by them. Uh, some books for you to check out. Uh, pruning and Training, it is the Pruning Bible. Um, I, it, for that reference that I keep telling you about Know Your Species and What It Will Tolerate, that book is a gold mine of information. Um, tree Basics and Tree Bruning Basics, both by Dr. Alex Shigo. They're very short, 32-page illustrated, great reference guides. And last but not least, additional publications are always available through the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Thank you very much for listening. Had a blast talking to you today. Good luck and go cut something. Up next is the practical part of pruning, after which we'll take questions. Part two of our pruning basics course. This is going to be our hands-on portion today. We're here at the teaching garden. Um, 
Before we get into actual pruning, I wanted to take a quick moment to go over tools. We had talked about them during the um, classroom session. Um, most importantly, things to remember about tools is you need to keep them sharp. If they are not sharp, they are not gonna be effective and you could actually hurt yourself and or hurt, make a really bad cut just because it, things went sideways. Um, we have a number of different tools down here. Uh, for your hand pruners, we talked about this, anything that's as small as your pinky or smaller. You don't wanna be pruning anything larger than that with these. These are Felcos, these are a number eight, but you can see there's also a variety of sizes. This is a number six in my hand. It's a smaller blade and also a different style of handle, slightly smaller handle. They make them uh, up through, I think, a 10 to a 12 maybe, uh, left-handed or right-handed. So check out what's available in terms of Felco's. They are the best hand pruners out there. There are other brands. Do not say that Felco's are the only ones, but they are great. What did blade you want to say? Blade is replaceable. And yes, the blade is replaceable so that you can change it out if you need to, but if you're keeping them sharp and cleaning them up every season, you shouldn't need to replace that blade. Uh, we also have a number of hand saws here. This one's nice and compact, so you can use it in a small space. This one's a little bit longer, also folding, so that it's uh, got a little bit of a safety. This one sticks on me though, so I apologize for that. If you can't find a collapsible, or if you would prefer, this is my preference, is to have one in a sheath, so I can just pull it out whenever I'm ready. This is a handsaw that I got as a give me a giveaway, uh, but uh, some great names out there. are Silky is one of the best of the line, but that's really top end. Homeowners, Coronas are great. Felcos are great. Um, any, uh, there's a number of varieties at various stores that you can look at and shop online these days. Much easier and you can see everything. Uh, this last little saw is actually a drywall saw, also by Corona but I use it for cutting girdling roots, um, for anything that's, I'm not trying to do a pretty cut on if I'm just trying to get it out of the way because it's dead. <clears throat> but mostly just for girdling roots, that's why that's so dirty. <laughs> <clears throat> now over here, well actually, let's take a step up. I told you that that's, these are only for things that are small. When you need to go to the next size up, you're gonna be looking at what are called compound pruners. They're a larger bypass style pruner. They can be extended depending on what variety you get, but they just give you a whole lot more power because you have a lot more angle and reach if you need to get inside of a plant. Uh, sometimes your woody perennials, you want to take out the inner death. That's the way to do it. It's with something that gives you reach. Uh, this is another handsaw. A great idea. The straight blades actually get in a little bit tighter spaces than the curved blades do. So take a look at the different variations out there. And this is a pole saw. There are a number of varieties out there. You can also get ones that have uh, a ratchet system. They extend some of them. This one does so that you can actually get some length out of it to get up into a tree, get some of those lower limbs. If you can't reach it with something like a hand uh, pull saw, you need, feel the need to climb up on something. Stop. Don't do it. <laughs> Never a good idea to be standing on something and trying to prune at the same time. Uh, that covers just about everything here except for this last little pile. We talked about safety. Make sure you're wearing safety goggles. Whatever you're doing, there is a, such a wide variety out there. Uh, shaded, clear, these particular ones are notch. Um, they are tree industry standard um, because they do completely wrap around and they give you the opportunity to have, like I said, shaded or clear depending on what you want. It's just up to your preference. Okay, let's uh, head over into the garden and we'll do some actual pruning. All right, so first things we're gonna do here is we're gonna point out a couple of things that are bad <laughs> that we that you don't want to see on your own trees that you want to address this branch clearly broke 
can actually see how it ripped off at some point. This is gonna need to be cut back. You're gonna need to take it to the healthy lateral. So you're gonna take it just behind this knuckle in order to get it to a place where it's gonna be able to hopefully heal itself. This tree has some aging issues, so it might not heal as well as we want. I can show you some examples of that along the way. Uh, right over here, this is a stub cut. You can see that what was left behind is too much. This should have been taken, let me get my finger out here, back here to the branch collar. You can see this branch collar right here, running along my finger. So the final cut should have been back to about here and up Why? So that way, when the codic principle kicks in, this branch collar is going to seal over the cut and make for a healthy um, wall of uh, wood so that it will no longer be able to take in pathogens and decay and pests. Uh, if you come around to this side, there was a great example of a really pretty healing wound right here. That was a good cut. It was made outside of the branch collar and the branch collar has started to move in and wrap around and seal over the original wound. Given time, it will seal completely, but it's gonna take time. This is years old. I'm going at least three years old. All right. Uh, there's a variety of other good and bad cuts throughout this tree, but I All think right, we've I've done enough of that. This branch, it's pretty much dead at this point. It's had a lot taken off of it over the years. Um, we are gonna make, we're gonna do a three-step cut like we showed you in class. Um, we're gonna make sure that we take into consideration the branch collar on this one. If you look right here at the very top, you can see the bark ridge that has developed. Right here is the edge of your branch collar where that ridge kind of stops. And you're gonna take that cut down right to about here, okay? But first, that'll be my final cut. We're gonna start out here, make our undercut, and then go across the top so that we don't let the branch rip backwards. Excuse me while I don my safety gear. <laughs> Saw down. Right. Sorry about the delay there, folks. All right, so our first cut is gonna be here. And we wanna go about halfway through, a third to a half. I'm gonna make my next cut farther out. Oh, awkward angle. Now you can see that I've gone past the original cut, so I can snap it off. And when it ripped away, it stopped at my base cut. So it did not come back and rip through into the base of uh, this limb, into the heart of the structure. That would prevent it from healing later. I'm gonna have to change positions here. Just because of the angle that I'm working at. And when I get just about to the end, I'm gonna slow down and finish my cut. You can see if you come across the top where that ridge ended, you can see that I cut just. Our first cut is gonna be probably right about here, about halfway through. Our second cut will be a little farther out. Our last and final cut will come across from here. This is the very edge of my branch collar. This is so distinct and pretty and easy to see. And all the way to the bottom again, I can still see it down here. So I'm gonna have a nice easy cut to make. Okay, so first cut comes in from underneath. Remember, try not to hit the other things around it. You only wanna cut this branch, not the whole tree. I've gone about halfway through. I'm gonna come about an inch or so out. And now I'm almost even with that original cut. And as I snap it off, you can see where it stopped, right where I wanted it to. Now our final cut is gonna come in, like I said, from that branch collar. It's 
slow it down a little bit to the end. And there you go. All over this branch. These are perfectly harmless. They tend to form on older trees um, and stuff that has rougher bark, trees with rougher bark. But they are harmless. They're not gonna do anything. Don't freak out if you see it on your trees. Okay, so we're here with the native witch hazel. Uh, it blooms yellow flowers. This is in our teaching garden. It's one of our prized trees. We love it so. But I wanted to take a quick moment to point out this conflicting branch. You can see here, this branch is rubbing along its neighbor. It's not gonna do us any good to leave this branch here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that off. It is small enough below my pinky size so I can use my hand pruners. And if Nancy can get in super tight here, you can see this gorgeous branch ridge or branch collar. It's ridged, I can see it clearly. You can see how the bark is building and building those ridges that we've talked about. Right outside of there is where I'm gonna make my cut. Excuse me while I put my safety gloves back on. So you wanna make sure you have a good grip on your equipment and on the tree. You don't wanna let the tree just dangle or the branch just dangle. All right, if you can see there's my ridge and I'm gonna make my cut just past that. Clean, snap. One of the things that we talked about in class was the four Ds, the things that you wanna remove from your tree. Dead branches, diseased branches, decaying branches, and deranged. The crossing conflicting branch on the witch hazel was a good example of deranged. This tree, while it has lots of the lichen that we just talked about, does not really have much deadwood or disease. But this branch, having had several cuts to it along the way, is now in a, a state of decay. This is our third D. So we're gonna take this one off. We're gonna look for our branch collar. It's down here. It's very hard to see on this particular tree, but it is there. If you can see it right about here, a couple little bits of ridge, but it's very hard to see, covered up by a lot of the lichen. Um, so it's sometimes challenging to find your cuts. This is a little bit bigger than my hand pruners will allow, so I'm gonna use my compounds for this particular cut. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm gonna take this little nugget out of my way so that I can make a nice clean cut and not worry about making any damage as I go. All right, so now I can get in here with my compounds, get right to that branch ridge, make sure I'm meeting it on the other side, and there you go. Good? All right, so we're here with some boxwoods and we're gonna look at these for a variety of reasons. Boxwoods tend to have a lot of beautiful dense growth on the outer edge of the plants. A lot of people tend to shear them and that's really not the best way to handle it because all that does is amplify that exterior growth. But if you open them up and you look inside, there's nothing growing in there but there is a lot of potential if we bring in a little bit of light. We wanna do this not just for the health of the plant itself, but that health is gonna prevent things like disease and pests and mold from setting in to that dense walled off space. There's no airflow in there. That's not really gonna be beneficial for the long-term health of these plants. So the things that we talked about as part of going through your pruning is you want to plan what you're going to do. What we want to do for this is we want to try and bring some light into it. We want to be able to see pockets of light. And right now you can't see anything. You couldn't, you can't see the next plant behind it. If you could put a paper behind it when we were done, if I took the time to do this, which would be hours, you would be able to see the headline can't read the paper, but you should be able to at least get a glimpse of the headline. But for now, we're gonna try and make some cuts to give you some examples of what we're talking about. If I come in here and I start taking out some of these larger chunks, it's going to allow light to begin to penetrate. 
I'm gonna take these cuts down as far as I can. I'm not sure, Nancy, can you see into here? No stubs, right? No stubs, same theory. I'm coming all the way down to a healthy lateral and I'm taking a clean cut and bringing my piece out. And if we- I'm, I'm stopping it for a second. Uh -huh. Okay, so we've made a few more cuts to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. See how much you can see in this space. You can see in little holes here and it's so much freer for airflow and light is gonna be able to get inside and it's gonna be able to hit all of these little epi, epicormic <laughs> branches that are gonna come out from these meristems that are along the way. This plant is super healthy, but look at how little growth is on the inside of the plant and how big of a chunk I took out in order to start bringing in some of this opening. Don't be afraid to make some big cuts. It'll bounce back, most will. Now, the other thing to keep in mind for boxwoods, this is one of those sensitive plants that we talked about. Normally, you wanna wait until between February 14th and maybe about March 1st to do your boxwood pruning. It's kind of a short window. You can get away with till mid-March, but you don't wanna get into the spring and you wanna make sure that you're doing it late enough that you're avoiding a heavy freeze because pruning a boxwood and some other sensitive plants, stone fruits, they don't bounce back as well from pruning at, and a hard freeze coming right behind it. It will damage the plants. Okay, talk about One of the last things I wanna talk about in regards to bushes, we mentioned how some people will shear them to get that level across the board. If you wanna reduce the height of your plant, you can come inside and find some of these longer branches that are coming out. Like, let's see, this guy right here, where does he come from? He comes from way down in there. But if I take out that one branch, it's gonna bring down the height of my tree, my bush, and also allow some of that light to start coming in. So you can go through and find some of the higher ones, bring them down to a good lateral and leave that for one year, go back another year, and then you can take the next highest and get to that point. It might take two seasons to get the ideal height, but you can do it. This is a mock orange. I have one of these at my house, I love it. Um, I mentioned this in the video. I usually prune my mock orange after it is flowered in the spring, which is really kind of late May, um, <coughs> just because it's so beautiful. This is what we would consider a multi-stemmed plant. Uh, it is a woody perennial. It's not technically a tree, but it does have some significant height. Remember, we talked about how they both kind of go together. Um, some can be a, a, a bush can turn into a tree and a tree can be in a bush form. Um, some of the things I wanted to point out here, obviously the multi-stemmed, um, when you're dealing with a plant like this, you don't need to necessarily think about the branch collar quite as much unless you're just trying to say lighten a limb and you only want to take off a portion. And really, you're not even looking for the branch collar there. You want to cut back to a healthy lateral where you see the buds coming out for new growth. You can take your cuts all the way down at the base and it's not going to be a problem for something like this because as you can see, it's got both old and new growth in it. The older growth is kind of a little grayer. It's got a bark to it. If you look at it, you can kind of see how it's got a little bit of etching in the bark, but the younger, newer growth is more brown, reddish even, depending on your colors. And you can see how it ages and it becomes a much grayer to a much more obvious aged wood. Right. Deep down on a plant like this, and you wanna do this to thin it out so that that new growth has a place to go. But you can take your cut all the way down at the bottom. I'm gonna take a couple of these little snippets out real fast that didn't get taken down. But you can take it down all the way to the base of the plant. And then come back up and pull out what you just took out. There is a little bit of new growth up there, 
but ultimately the whole plant is going to be much healthier for it. It's going to give room and space for all of these new canes to come in and fill up. Okay. Now we will take some questions.